Final day of our pre-calculus review. You'll have a pre-calculus quiz on Tuesday of next week. There's a practice pre-calculus quiz posted at the website. You might want to download that and make sure that you're comfortable with all the ideas there. There's also a list of practice pre-calculus problems that I've posted on my website. Uh, you should probably be able to be comfortable with all of those before you take the pre-calc exam. You should work through those. If you need any help in how to answer those questions, please come and see me or see the, <coughs> uh, the folks in the math center or see Tori uh, or uh, see the supplemental instruction leader and you'll be able to get some help before next Tuesday. Okay, so what we did at the end of the last lecture was look at how to describe intervals on the x-axis. What we'll do today to start with is show what sorts of questions or situations might lead you to an answer that looks like an interval on the x-axis. And then we'll look at some properties of functions, how to move graphs of functions around, and then we'll finish up by looking at some trigonometry ideas. Okay, so there are two important situations where the answer to the proposed question will be typically an interval on the x-axis. One type is what we refer to as quadratic, I'm sorry, polynomial or rational inequalities. Polynomial slash rational inequalities. Right. Throw this guy away. For example, you're interested in finding all of the x values, find the x values for which x squared minus x minus 6 is less than or equal to 0. Okay, so you're interested in all the x values that make this statement true. In order to solve an inequality that involves some sort of polynomial like this, and we know what a polynomial is, step one, step one is find where the given expression, let's call this f of x, the function f of x equals zero. Step two, use those values as what I'm going to call as cut points on the x-axis. And then step three is check interior values, check values between the cut points. So here's the general method to find the solutions to an expression that looks like a polynomial either less than or equal to zero or less than zero or bigger than or equal to zero or bigger than zero. We'll call that a polynomial inequality. Uh, quick remark, this method only works when you have a zero on one side of the inequality. If you start with an expression that doesn't have a zero here, that could happen in theory. It won't happen to the naturally occurring problems in calculus. All you'd need to do is pull everything to the other side just by subtracting and force yourself to have a zero there. So we can assume that all of the problems that you will confront this semester will be of this form. Some expression either less than or equal to zero, less than zero, bigger than or equal to zero, bigger than zero. And the methodology is you take the given function, which here we're calling f of x, x squared minus x minus 6, you find out where it equals 0. Okay, that might not be an easy question to answer. In the situation that we're handed here, it's not too bad to do. It's just a quadratic, so at worst, you just haul out the quadratic formula. That would tell you what input values give you 0. But I've happened to have given you a function that factors relatively easily. So that's what f of x happens to be. So now what we're going to do is draw an x-axis, figure out where this equals 0. Well, f of x equals 0 either when x is 3, 
or when x is negative 2. So I'm going to use those two values as what I'm going to call for the remainder of the semester cut points. And now here's what the game is. When you draw the cut points, you've then divided the x-axis into a bunch of intervals. Here's an interval, here's an interval, here's an interval. What you need to do is take what I'm going to refer to as test points inside each of the intervals. Take a test point, plug that particular value back into the original inequality, and see whether or not that particular value makes the inequality true or not. If that particular value makes the inequality true, then the beauty of this method then allows you to conclude that every value in this interval will make the inequality true. And conversely, if this particular input value makes the inequality false, then every one of the input values in this interval will make the inequality false. So pick, uh, pick a test value. I like to draw those a little bit smaller than my cut values. Plug in a value less than negative 2. Now there's something out here, how about negative 3? Let's plug it into the original expression and see whether or not it makes the original expression true. If I plug in negative 3 here, I get positive 9 minus minus 3. So that's positive 12 minus 6, which is positive 6. Does that make something less than or equal to 0? No, because positive 6 is not less than or equal to 0. So I'm going to write the word no here. didn't work. Pick something in between negative 2 and 3. How about, well, if you have a chance to choose 0, you might as well, because 0 is an easy value to compute with. x squared minus x minus 6. If I plug in x equals 0, I get 0 minus 0 minus 6. Minus 6 is certainly less than or equal to 0. So yes, this particular input value worked, therefore the entire input interval works. And if I plug in something out here, let's say a test value of 4, plug in 4, I get 4 squared, that's 16, minus 4, that's 12, minus 6, which gives positive 6, which is not less than or equal to 0, and you get the answer no here. So here's the answer. You've found that the only values that work, in other words, the only values that make the inequality true are those that come from this interval. So the answer to the requested solve this inequality looks like those x values. Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing before we get to the conclusion. You then have to ask yourself whether or not the cut values themselves make the inequality true. For example here, if I plug in negative 2 itself, does it make the inequality true? It does, because if I plug in negative 2, I get 0 here. Is 0 less than or equal to 0? It is, because of the less than or equal to sign here. Similarly, 3 itself works as well. So here then is the solution to the requested quadratic inequality. The solution is all x values that live between minus 2 and 3. If I were to ask you to draw your answer as an interval on the x-axis, you would draw it by including the two endpoints and then drawing minus 2 to 3. Okay. So here then are the, here then is the solution to the quadratic or this uh, polynomial inequality. This given as set notation, this given as a picture on the x-axis. Now, in order to solve somewhat more complex expressions, at least inequalities associated with those, if we have a rational inequality, rational inequality, well, let's see, rational inequality is simply a rational function involving an inequality bigger than or less than zero might look something like this, x squared minus 4 divided by x, let's say, plus 1, uh, bigger than or equal to 0. So find all the x values, x values with this being true. So now we have a rational function involving an inequality. Again, the inequality, if it doesn't involve zero, you simply throw everything to the other side to get a zero on one side, but all of the ones that will naturally arise in this course will involve a zero on one side of the inequality. The slightly different set of steps that you need to use in order to evaluate a rational inequality is you're doing the same sorts of things but instead of just looking at where the 
polynomial is zero, you have to treat both the numerator and denominator as separate polynomials and get cut points depending on either where the numerator is zero or where the denominator is zero. So let's call this step one sort of on steroids or step one enlarged in a situation where we've got a rational inequality, find where either the numerator, the numerator or denominator is zero. Denominator is zero, then use those values as cut points. As cut points. Okay. Then steps two and three are the same. Steps two and three. Step two, step three are the same. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that here. In this particular case, the numerator is x squared minus 4. Set x squared minus 4 equal to 0 and solve for x. We get x equals 2 and x equals negative 2. You can do that by quadratic formula or just by looking. I need numbers whose square is 4. For the denominator, we're looking at the expression x plus 1 equals 0. So we get one cut value, negative 1. So I'm going to draw an x-axis and then identify, in this particular problem, three cut values that came up. The value 2, the value negative 1, and the value negative 2. So because I've got three cut values, I've got four intervals that I need to check. And I'll simply pick test values from each of these intervals. So let's pick something out here when x is less than negative 2, how about negative 3? If I plug in negative 3, let's see what happens. I get negative 3 squared, that's 9 minus 4, so that's 5 in the numerator here. Negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2, so I get 5 divided by negative 2, which is negative. So because neg the input negative 3 produced a negative expression, that means that none of the expressions inside that particular interval going to work. Let's look at some test values. Plug in minus 3 halves, plug in, let's say, 0 inside this interval, and plug in, I don't know, maybe 3 inside this interval. So I want to show you a shortcut, and the shortcut is this. You know, we're not really interested in the specific output values that come up when an interval or intervals on the x-axis are typically referred to as absolute value inequality. And these are expressions that, well, they could look more general than the ones I'm about to show you, but the ones that I'm about to show you are the ones that naturally arise in a calculus context, so we'll focus mostly on those. For example, find all the x values that have the property that the absolute value of x minus 3 is less than or equal to 2. So there's an absolute value involved, and there's an inequality involved, hence the name. Well, if you scratch your head for a minute and ask what values of x are going to work here, well, for instance, if you plug in 3 itself, the absolute value of 3 minus 3 is the absolute value of 0, which is 0, which is certainly less than or equal to 2. So certainly 3 itself works. And let's see, if I plug in something like 4, well, 4 minus 3 is 1. That's certainly less than or equal to 2. So 4 works, and 3 and a half works, and stuff in there works. Oh, and it looks like 5 works also. And stuff up to 5 looks like it works. If I plug in something like 6, 6 minus 3 is 3. That's certainly not less than or equal to 2. Notice also, though, if I go the other direction, if I plug in like 2 and a half, or if I plug in 2, oh, 2 minus 3 is minus 1. Its absolute value is 1, which is still less than or equal to 2, and we're still good. If I plug in 1, 1 minus 3 is negative 2. The absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2, which is still less than or equal to 2. And now we see what happens is if I get too far away, for instance, if I plug in 0, I get the absolute value of 0 minus 3 which is the absolute value of negative 3, which is positive 3, which is not less than or equal to 2. 
So the stuff out here doesn't work. So what seems to be happening is that I can get to, well, on that end I get out to 5, and on this end I get out to 1, and all the stuff in between works and the stuff outside doesn't work. And that indeed is what happens. So here's 1, here's 5, here's 3 in the middle, and the answer to this absolute value inequality looks like the collection of things between minus 1 and 5, or the collection of things 1 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 5. Now that seems sort of C to the pants. Some of you probably come in here having memorized some sort of algorithm that tells you how to write down the answer to things that look like absolute value inequalities. What I'm going to ask you to do, because it's a more natural context in a calculus course, to think about inequal I'm sorry, to think about absolute values of differences in this way, is to interpret this. It turns out, note, that if I ever hand you an expression that looks like the absolute value of one thing minus another, and I don't care what those two things are, this can always be interpreted as can always be interpreted as the distance from the value A to the value B on the x-axis. And here's why this interpretation of the absolute value of the difference between one thing and another is an intuitively much clearer way to attack these absolute value inequalities than any sort of memorization of an algorithm. What's this then asking? If you interpret this left-hand side as the difference between where x is and where 3 is on the axis, what you're asking is, tell me those things so that the distance between x and 3 is less than or equal to 2. Well, I know all those things. You go to 3 and you figure out those things that are 2 units on one side and 2 units on the other side, and there's the solution. So that, for example, if we want you to solve something like the absolute value of x minus 4 bigger than 3, I'm going to interpret this left-hand side as the distance between x and the number 4 is supposed to be at least 3. So what I'm going to do is locate 4 on the x-axis, and I'm interested in those x values that have distance away from 4 more than 3 units, so I'm going to go 3 units on either side of 4. If I go 3 units this way, I get to 1, and I want those things that are more than 3 units away. I'll go 3 units this way, from 4, I get to 7, and I want those things that are more than 3 units away. So there's the answer of the number line, written as intervals, using the set notation. I want the x values such that x is either less than 1, together with the x values that are bigger than 7. That's the value inequalities. Let's try one where it's maybe not as obvious. Solve this absolute value inequality, x plus 2 less than or equal to 4. All right, now here's the issue. The only time you can interpret an absolute value expression as a distance on a number line is when the expression in between the two symbols is a negative sign, and we don't have that here but we just do a quick bit of algebra, we just rewrite this as this, which typically doesn't seem like a good trade-in, but in this particular situation, now I can interpret this, because now I've got the absolute value of something minus something else. I identify the expression that I'm handed, which is now negative 2, and what I'm interested in is all those x values, so that the distance between x and negative 2 is less than or equal to 4 units, so I'll just go 4 units on either side of negative 2. If I do that here, I get to positive 2. If I go 4 units in this direction from negative 2, I get to negative 6. And I'm looking for those things that are at most that many units away, so I'm going to fill in all of the expressions in between. So there's the solution given on the number line, and as 
using the set notation, it's those things between minus 6 and positive 2. So there are absolute value inequalities. Now clearly this expression doesn't cover all possible cases. If I hand you a square here or something like that, okay, then we have to do something different. But it turns out that expressions of this type, the absolute value of x minus something, are precisely the types of expressions that we'll be interested in looking at in a calculus context. So that's why we focus our attention mostly on those. All right. Now yeah, we'll spend the rest of our time in our pre-calculus review looking at trigonometry, which will play an extremely important role. Actually, let me, let me mention one more property that will be of use later on in the calculus course, and that's this. So an aside about graphs, about graphs of functions. So if you hand me the graph of a function, maybe something like f of x equals x squared. So maybe here's f of x equals x squared. What we may be interested in doing is taking that shape and moving it in various directions. Now there's going to be ways also of stretching and shrinking and that sort of thing, but the most important sort of movement that we'll be interested in here is moving things around. And in effect, there's four different directions that we can move, either left or right or up or down. And the way that you take some function that you're starting with and move the graph around is easy to effect. If you want to move the thing a certain number of units to the left or to the right, you change the input expression by that amount. So for example, f of x minus 2 moves the graph 2 units to the right. So for instance, in this case, if I were to graph f of x minus 2, I'd take this graph and I would wind up moving it 2 units this way with the same shape. So here's f of x minus 2. Now for some students that's a little bit counterintuitive because you're thinking, well, it's a negative sign. How come you're not moving it in the negative direction? And the way I think about that is you're, you're trying to figure out which input value will give you the same sort of thing as the original x but shoved two units to the right. Well, what you have to do is sort of compensate for the fact that you input x minus 2 by well, putting in a value, moving it before you input it, and then running it through the function. Think, for what input value should the output value be the same as what happened at zero? Well, what happened at input value zero for the original function is now happening at input value two, so that means you're moving two units to the right. Okay, similarly, f of x plus two moves the graph two units to the left. Of course, there's nothing special about the value two. I've just used that as a specific example. So here is f of x plus two. And then to move the graph left, I'm sorry, up or down is not too difficult. You simply sort of add after the fact. f of x plus two moves the graph two units up and f of x minus 2 moves the graph 2 units down. Okay. So the point is this, if you change the input value, you're moving the graph left or right. If you change the output value here, in other words, you first do the function and then you add or subtract something, you're moving the function up or down. All right. Now let's do some trigonometry. So trig. Whirlwind review of trig. Okay, the first is a caveat. We will never use degrees in here. So degree measurement is out. We will only use radians. So what I would ask you to do right now is, you know, stop the videotape, take your calculator, 
make sure that it's set to radians and then put some duct tape over the button and make sure that it never goes back to degrees. Degrees are fine as far as it goes, but degree measure is just completely artificial. I think it was developed by the Babylonians who were fixated on the number 6 or the number 36 and somehow tried to use that as the basis of their numbering system and so when trying to bust up the uh, you know, a, a complete circle into pieces, it turned out that was a natural unit of measurement for them. In a calculus setting, there are only radians. That's the only natural unit of, of measurement of angles. I will ask you to uh, become re-familiar with the radian description of various important angles. So if we look at, for instance, the unit circle, and we draw some angles. Of course, this is the angle zero radians. What we assign, and this is why radian measure becomes natural, is the following. How many units should we assign to one complete revolution of the circle? The Babylonians assigned that number 360. We're going to assign that number 2 pi. And the reason 2 pi makes sense is because if you decide that you've drawn your circle in such a way that its radius is one unit, then 2 pi not only is going to represent the angle amount that we get in going around, it also represents exactly what the length of the corresponding arc is. So if we assign the number 2 pi to that, well, that's precisely the length of the arc because that's the circumference of a circle of radius 1. It's 2 pi r or 2 pi here. So this, all the way around, is associated with 2 pi. So if I only go halfway around, then I've associated that with half of 2 pi, in other words, with pi. If I only go a quarter way around, then I've associated that with a quarter of 2 pi, in other words, 2 pi over 4, better known as pi over 2. If I then cut that in half, in other words, if I look at what you until about five minutes ago would have called a 45 degree angle. We're going to call that the angle pi over 4, etc. It makes sense to talk about radian measure with negative numbers as well. For instance, this would be the angle negative pi over 2. It makes sense to talk about angles bigger than 2 pi. For instance, the angle 4 pi is the angle that you get by starting here and going around twice, etc. So there are only radian measures here. Now let's look at trigonometric functions. It is probably the case that you were introduced to trigonometric functions in the context of triangles. And that's perfectly good, at least as far as it goes in trying to compute various uh, angles, the uh, sine and cosine and trigonometric functions of various angles. If you hand me an angle that lives as part of a right triangle, we'll call the angle, this is the standard notation, Greek letter theta, then inside a, a, a right triangle, the sine of theta is, and you gave names to these sides, this was called the opposite side of theta, this was called the adjacent side of theta, and this is called the hypotenuse of the triangle. The sine of theta is defined to be the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. And the cosine of theta is defined to be the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. And the tangent of theta is defined to be the opposite side divided by the adjacent side, which also happens to be just the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta. Now, that's all well and good if you are only interested in interpreting angles in the context of a right triangle. The significantly more important use of trigonometric functions is as follows. We expand our horizon and don't restrict ourselves to angles that just live as part of right triangles. We allow angles as described before, as simply how many times have you gone around the unit circle? Pi over 2 times corresponds to going around exactly once. Or, I'm sorry, angle, pi, uh, angle 2 pi corresponds to going around exactly once. Angle pi goes, corresponds to going around exactly uh, half a time, etc. 
What we do is the following. Look back at the unit circle. So again, look at, well, the unit circle means the circle that has radius 1 that's centered at the origin. So here's what it looks like. Unit circle. Well, I know the equation for the unit circle. I know that the unit circle is described by looking at all the points that have the property x squared plus y squared equals 1. In other words, this is the equation that describes that collection of points. Notice the equation is not a function, because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. But the collection of all points that satisfy the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1, there they are. OK, well, I know how to do, at least I know how to describe angles in this context. What I do is I view this as the angle 0, and I measure everything from it. We've agreed to measure positive in the counterclockwise direction. Here, then, is some angle. I'll call it theta. And instead of trying to interpret what the sine and the cosine of theta are in the context of a right triangle, all we need to do is ask the following question. What coordinates and do that point have? In other words, what are the coordinates of this point? Well, it's some point on the unit circle. And by definition, what we're going to do is describe the coordinates of this point by giving them a name. The coordinates of that point, the x-coordinate of the point, is what I'm going to call cosine of theta. And the y-coordinate of the point is what I'm going to call sine theta. So rather than viewing sine and cosine as some sort of opposite over adjacent or opposite over hypotenuse in the context of triangles, the way we're going to define sine and cosine of an angle is simply place the angle in its standard position in the unit circle, and then tell me the coordinates of the point where the angle where that second ray that makes up the angle hits the unit circle. Whatever the x-coordinate is, call it cosine theta. Whatever the y-coordinate is, call it sine theta. This description of sine and cosine agrees exactly with that description of sine and cosine. But the significant benefit to viewing the sine and cosine functions in this way is now there's no restriction. The angle doesn't have to be between 0 and 180 degrees. It doesn't have to live in any context of a right triangle. It's simply tell me what the coordinate of that point is. And the question is, well, why is that sort of behavior interesting? Here's why. If we view this as a function, we view, let's start with the sine function. f of x equals sine x as a function of input value x. Let's see what its graph looks like. All right, well. Let's see, if I ask what's f of 0, well, let's do the interpretation of what sine of an angle is. You take the angle, you put it in the unit circle, you look at where the corresponding ray, well, the ray for the angle 0 is precisely this line, you look at where that ray hits the unit circle, and you identify its coordinates. Of course, the coordinates when you're looking at 0, well, what's the coordinates at that point? It's x value 1 y value 0. So because the y value is 0, the sine of 0 is 0. There we go. Now, as we increase theta, in other words, as we change the angle, what's happening to the y coordinate of the point? Well, the y coordinate of the point's going up. The y coordinate of the point just sort of follow what the altitude of the point is. It's going up. The altitude of the point's going up until it finally reaches this altitude. In other words, altitude 1. And that happens when the angle is, well, what you got when you went a quarter of the way around the circle. That was angle pi over 2. So when the angle is pi over 2, the corresponding sine value is 1. Because the sine value represents the y coordinate of the place where the ray hits the unit circle. Keep going. Oh, now the sine, it's still positive, but it's now decreasing. The y value is going down as we increase the angle until we get to this ray. Well, that's the ray corresponding to value pi. And when we get to pi, the y coordinate of the point where that ray hits the, uh, hits the unit circle is 0. So we're back down to 0. And now we can just keep going. Well, now the y coordinate of these points is negative. 
So we get down here. In fact, all the way until we get to this angle, this is the angle 3 pi over 2. And when we get to angle 3 pi over 2, then the sine is as big in the negative direction as it gets because of the coordinate of that point is 0 comma negative 1. And then finally, the sine continues to increase. It's still negative, but it increases until it gets back to 0, and it gets back to 0 at input value 2 pi. 2 pi. And by following what's happening to the sine function, we get a curve that looks something like this. And now the point is, this repeats. Now what happens if you're looking at an angle that looks like 2 pi plus something? All the way up to 2 pi plus pi over 2, so that's 5 pi over 2. And then looking out here at 3 pi. The answer is, as far as the picture goes, what's the y-coordinate? It's just going to be the same as whatever the y-coordinate of the previous version was when you drew it 2 pi, uh, when you drew it 2 pi radians down the road. Similarly, if you were to go in a negative direction, it would So here's the graph of sine x. The reason that this is significantly more important point of view, especially in a calculus course, is there are so many phenomena in nature whose description resembles an expression that looks like this. The amount of daylight you know, per day over the course of a year or the position of waves in the ocean, or radio waves, or what are called mass spring systems, etc. So what we're interested in doing is having fundamental functions that somehow describe that sort of behavior. And the sine function is a perfectly good function as long as we get out of the, you know, the, the necessity to somehow interpret the sine function as the context of some sort of right triangle. If you view it as the y-coordinate of the place where the angle hits the unit circle, then the interpretation is clear. Okay. So there's sine x as a function. Let's view cosine x as a function. Similarly, uh, g of x equals cosine x. Uh, it can be viewed as a function of x. x. Here's what its graph looks like. We just sort of follow the ball here. Of course, now when the angle is 0, 0 radians, we identify that coordinate on the unit circle. And the cosine function represents the x coordinate of that point. And when the value is 0, when the angle is 0, the cosine is 1, because the x coordinate is 1. And playing the same game, we simply follow what's happening along the unit circle to the x-coordinate rather than to the y-coordinate. And what we get is a graph that looks something like this. So if you're keeping your eye on the x-coordinate, just figure out how, what, what the position of the point is horizontally. As the thing moves around the circle, it's sort of moving back down. And then when it gets to pi, then the x-coordinate starts coming back. And then it comes, so we get this sort of movement back and forth in the cosine function this way, the same way that we looked at movement up and down for the sine function. So here's what the cosine function looks like. Here's input value 0, pi over 2, input value pi, sorry, input value pi goes down to negative 1, input value 3 pi over 2, etc. Okay. All right. So here's the cosine function. Now, note, and I know that a big deal is made out of the fundamental trigonometric identity that says that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, that somehow you use the Pythagorean theorem and you blah, blah. Folks, the fact that the fundamental trigonometric identity that relates sines and cosines, namely that cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1, from this point of view is just an artifact of the description of what sine and cosine are. It's you take a point, 
that lives on this curve. Well, to say it lives on this curve means if you take its x-coordinate and square it, and you take its y-coordinate and square it, that you get 1. So this follows immediately by the description of what sine and cosine are. Immediately. From the definition of sine and cosine. Okay. Now here's the reality, and this is sort of born from years of experience. What you will need to do if these aren't firmly planted in your head right now is you'll need to memorize the sine and cosine values of basic trigonometric uh, angles, of the standard trigonometric angles, in such a way that you don't have to think for a minute or two to figure out what those values are. So make a table which looks like this, angle, angle, let's call it theta. Uh, I don't care if you put sine theta first or cosine theta first, makes no difference, and then cosine theta. And the basic angles that you'll need to have sort of in hand are 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2. If you want to do some things in the second quadrant as well, that's fine. But the ones that you'll need to have to pick out immediately, sort of without thinking, are these. And let's see if we can just fill in the table using the interpretation of the sine and cosine of an angle as the value at which the corresponding ray hits the unit circle. Okay, well, zero. So there's the angle zero. Sine of that angle is its y-coordinate, zero. Cosine of that angle, x-coordinate, one. Pi over six. So what's the y-coordinate of that point? Turns out to be half. X-coordinate of that point, square root of three over two. For pi over four, the angle formerly known as 45 degrees, the angle pi over four, sine and cosine turn out to be the same. That makes sense here. This is some sort of symmetric point. The x-coordinate and the y-coordinate are the same. And if that's going to be the case, then they live on the and they live in the unit circle, and it has to be root 2 over 2. Similarly, sine of pi over 3, root 3 over 2. Cosine of pi over 3, 1 half. Sine of pi over 2, let's see, sine of pi over 2, we can just knock it out. Just draw pi over 2 in the unit circle. Looks like the vertical angle here. The y-coordinate at that point, 1. The x-coordinate at that point, 0. For pi, sine, y-coordinate at that point, 0. Cosine, negative 1 because the x-coordinate of that point is negative 1. Similarly, if we're all the way down to 3 pi over 2 here, sine of that value, negative 1, cosine of that value, 0. And then once we get back to 2 pi, that's going to be the same as what's going on at 0, and we get 0 and 1. You will need to have these sort of you know, at your fingertips. If you're looking for intermediate values like 2 pi over 3 or something like that, then I would suggest rather than memorizing what's going on in the table, Rather than memorizing the table, just sort of do a symmetry analysis inside the unit circle. For instance, if you're looking at, let me try to draw pi over 3 here. So here's pi over 3. So there's pi over 3. Here's then 2 pi over 3. And the way I like to sort of analyze these things is, well, we're comparing that point to this point. We know the data about pi over 3 because we've got that at our fingertips now. So if we're looking for something like sine of 2 pi over 3 and cosine of 2 pi over 3, well, the sine of 2 pi over 3 and the sine of pi over 3 are the same because the y-coordinates are the same, and that's what the sine represents. And so I'm just going to pull out square root of 3 over 2. I know that value. On the other hand, the cosine has gone from whatever that x value is to negative of it. So the cosine of 2 pi over 3 is simply going to be the negative value of it. And that's going to make sense. As you draw this thing, the x-coordinate of that point is negative, and the y-coordinate of that point is still positive. Again, the, the, the data in this table is stuff that you'll just need to have at your fingertips. All right, now, the other four trigonometric functions can be described in terms of the two most basic functions, the sine and cosine function. So as we noted in the context of right triangles, tangent is just defined as sine over cosine. Notice there's no mention of opposites and hypotenuses or anything like that. Uh, cotangent is 
uh, 1 over tangent, which also can be viewed as cosine over, over sine. Uh, secant of theta is 1 over the cosine of theta. And cosecant of theta, cosecant of theta is 1 over sine of theta. OK. Uh, the graphs of these, uh, I'm not completely, well, I'm interested in them, but it turns out they don't show up as directly in Calculus 1 as the graphs of sines and cosines, which you'll absolutely need to have in mind front and center. OK. Uh, yeah, let's spend, I don't know, another 10 minutes or so, and then we'll call it a day here. So here are the two fundamental trigonometric functions, sine and cosine. Let's draw the graph of sine again. So here's f of x equals sine x. Looks like this. Here's 0, here's pi, here's 2 pi, 3 pi, this is pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, etc. So, question, does this function f of x equals sine x have an inverse function? Well, we know how to answer the question, does the specific function have an inverse function? You simply ask whether or not its graph passes the horizontal line test. And this function fails the horizontal line test miserably. I mean, look, there's horizontal lines that hit this curve not only at more than one place, but at infinitely many places. Heck, even the x-axis, there's a horizontal line. It hits this curve you know, every pi unit. So the answer is a resounding no, it does not. Now, what happened in the other situation where we had a function, a sort of basic function, namely the x squared function, what happened in that situation where the function itself didn't pass the horizontal line test and therefore didn't have an inverse function? What did we do to try to remedy the situation? Well, we sort of cut our losses and we, we simply looked at the function that is related to it but somehow, by restricting the domain, leaves a chunk that does pass the horizontal line test. So we traded in the x squared function for just the x squared function, but domain restricted to x bigger than or equal to 0. And once we did that, then we could write down an inverse function for it. And we called it some goofy name, you know, line, 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 which we happen to call square root. Essentially, that's what we're about to do here with the sine function. We're about to play the same game. The sine function doesn't have an inverse function because its graph doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So what we're going to do is restrict the domain in such a way that what's left over does pass the horizontal line test. And then we'll write down an inverse function for it by cooking up some new name for the inverse function. All right, so how should we restrict the domain? Well, it turns out there's lots of different ways of restricting the domain of the sine function so that what's left over passes the horizontal line test. For instance, this chunk of the sine function passes the horizontal line test throughout everything else. And this chunk of the sine function passes the horizontal line test. And this chunk of the sine function passes the horizontal line test. So we actually have a lot of choices here. But the choice that's most often made for how to restrict the domain of the sine function so that the piece that's left over does have an inverse function is to look at this one. We simply look inside the window between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 and talk about this function. So we look instead, we artificially restrict the domain, restrict the domain of the sine function to minus pi over 2 less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi over 2, the function that remains, 
that results then has an inverse function. Really, folks, it's exactly the same game that we played with the square function. The square function doesn't have an inverse function until you artificially restrict its domain somehow. Actually, for the square function, we could, although it'd be really silly, we could restrict the domain to x values less than or equal to zero, but you know, that's just distasteful. It's technically okay to do. What you'd be left with is, is, is a function that passes the horizontal line test, but we prefer to have positive input values. Same thing here. I mean, we could restrict the domain to that chunk of it, but typically the angles that come up more often are the angles between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay, so now we're going to look at this function. We still call it sine x, although some texts actually call it sine with a capital S. That's not bad notation, but we'll use the standard notation. So now consider this function. We'll still call it f of x equals sine x with domain artificially restricted between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So it has an inverse function because its graph just looks like this. I've wiped out everything else. So I've gotten rid of all of the issues with the graph not passing the horizontal line test. Okay. And so let's find its inverse function. Okay, so what do you do? You write down y equals whatever the function is. That's step one. Step two in the process is you switch roles. And then step three, you solve for y. Okay, what does it mean to solve for y here? It means to isolate y on one side here. Okay, so here's how we do that. We play exactly the same sort of game as we played when we got to the situation x equals y squared. We wanted to solve for y. And what did we do? We just artificially cooked up a symbol called the square root symbol and deemed that the expression y equals square root of x was to mean the same as x equals y squared. Well, we do the same thing here. It's just instead of some funny symbol with four lines, we cook up a new expression called ARCSIN. So the point is this. These two expressions mean exactly the same thing as long as you've assumed that the value of x is somewhere between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So let me write out what this symbol means. In other words, i.e., this symbol, A-R-C-S-I-N, the arc sine of x is the angle between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, whose sine is x. So for example, a R C S I N of a half is the angle between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 whose sine is a half. And because we've memorized that table, we know that that is pi over 6. Similarly, A R C S I N of 1. It's the angle between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 whose sine is 1. That happens to be pi over 2. Notice in the expression A R C S I N of this thing, because the sine function can only take on values between minus 1 and 1, the domain of the arc sine function is values between minus 1 and 1. The values that the arc sine function can spit out, by definition, are between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. All right. Now, a quick notational remark, which is this. Some of you come to the table instead of calling this ARCSIN of x, you call this SIN minus 1 of x. Technically, that's OK. But notationally, it's a disaster, because this can have two separate meanings. One is you know, the inverse sine function of x. That's fine. But what students sometimes tend to do is see the minus 1 and think, all right, 1 over, that somehow this should be secant. So even though this notation is not unreasonable and is relatively widely used, I just don't like it. So I'm going to prefer to not use that notation at all and to always use this notation.
Secondly, some of you have seen situations where instead of calling this little ARC, you call this capital ARC. That's fine. Capital A is typically meant to denote that the way that you've restricted the domain of the sine function to get an inverse is to use this particular interval between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. As I mentioned, there are technically other intervals that you could use, like pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2 or something like that. And so the capital A is typically meant to denote that you've chosen that one, but I'll use the little a to denote exactly that same function. So you want to use capital A, little a makes no difference. Okay. All right, we can play exactly the same game with the cosine function. So similarly, we need to we need to restrict the domain domain of the function g of x equals cosine x in order that it have an inverse function. And if we briefly revisit what the graph of the cosine function looks like, cosine of 0 is 1. The cosine function looks like this. And so the question is, for the cosine function, what's a natural way to throw out most everything in such a way that what's left over at least passes the horizontal line test? And the answer is, we can allow ourselves just to keep this portion of it. And then what remains passes the horizontal line test. And it turns out the natural way to hack at the domain of the cosine function in order that what's left passes the horizontal line test is to just look at the inputs between 0 and pi. So if we restrict cosine, cosine x, to domain between 0 to pi, then that version of the cosine function, this has an inverse function. And not surprisingly, we give it a name that's similar to that one, arc cosine of x. There's its inverse function. So to say that y is arc cosine of x is the same thing as saying that uh, x is cosine of y. Okay? And in words, the arc cosine of, of x, the arc cosine of a number, is the angle whose cosine is this number, since the cosine function also oscillates between minus 1 and 1. The value of x here has to be something between minus 1 and 1. For example, the arc cosine of 0 is 1. The angle whose cosine is 0. The, the, the arc cosine of... Shoot. The angle whose cosine... Yeah. The angle whose cosine is 1 is 0. Right. The angle whose cosine is 1 is the angle 0. So arc cosine of 1 is 0. And similarly, we can play the same sorts of games that we played with the sine function. Sorry, I got a little backed up there. All right, let me finish the whirlwind pre-calculus review by trying to play up the distinction between two types of questions that can be asked in the context of the relationship between an angle and the corresponding sine and cosine values of it. So here is a question. Uh, question one, find arc cosine of a half. Here's question two. Solve for x uh, cosine of x equals a half. Now if your gut reaction is, well, you've asked the same question twice. In fact, that's not the case. That's the point of this little uh, exercise at the end here. By definition, arc cosine of a half means the angle between 0 and pi, whose cosine is a half. OK, well, we've memorized the table here. Let's see. The angle whose cosine is a half turned out to be pi over 3. That's something that you'll just have to be able to pull out immediately, because uh, you'll review for a little while before the pre-calc quiz. And then hopefully you'll hang on to that for the remaining 14 and a half weeks of the course. On the other hand, well, you're thinking, let's see. So this is just asking for the angle whose cosine is a half. In fact, it's not. It's asking for all the possible angles whose cosine is a half. So we know one, 
we know, let's see, that cosine of pi over 3 is a half. But there are other angles that have the same cosine values. Let's see, if we're looking for angles whose cosine is a half, it means we're looking for places on the unit circle where the x-coordinate of the point where the thing hits the unit circle is a half. Well, there's two such places. It's any angle whose ray looks like that or any angle whose ray looks like that. We know this angle is pi over 3. But we know for the cosine function that if we go in the opposite direction, we'll also get an angle that has the same cosine. Oh, and it's the case that if I go around 2 pi units from any angle that has cosine equal a half, I'll get another angle whose cosine is a half. So in fact, also, cosine of minus pi over 3 is a half, and any other angle that we can get from these two by adding some multiple of 2 pi will work as well. Also, cosine of pi over 3 plus 2 pi is a half, and cosine of minus pi over 3 plus 2 pi is a half. Because all we're doing there is taking whatever angle we had and going around again, so we're going to wind up in exactly the same terminal ray. In fact, any angle that looks like this, angle of the form either pi over 3 plus any multiple of 2 pi that's typically denoted by 2 pi n, where n is a whole number, I'll use the word that I used in the last lecture, an integer, a whole number, or any angle of the form negative pi over 3 plus 2 pi n, where again, n is an integer. So the answer to question 1 is a single angle. Pi over 3 is the only angle. No, pi over 3 is the output of the function arc cosine when you plug in a half. A similar but not equal question is, tell me all the angles that have cosine equal to a half. Well, of course, pi over 3 works. But as we've just seen, so does negative pi over 3, and so does any expression that looks like pi over 3 or negative pi over 3 plus 2 pi n. OK, this is a good place to end our pre-calculus review. Again, the, there are uh, suggested exercises from the text that I'll have you do for uh, preparation for the pre-calculus quiz. There's also the pre-calculus quiz that I gave last semester to this class that you can use as a practice. That's available at the website. And uh, I will see you next week.